Good morning, good afternoon, colleagues, and welcome to the 11th Knowledge Cafe of the Integrated Policy Practitioner Network. I, my name is Marta Kali, I'm with the UN Development Coordination Office, and I'm going to be your host and facilitator today with thanks, for, uh, thanks to the I, IPPN. So, so I, I'm just going to say a couple of words to start this uh, session um, on, the, on, on the IPPN and on our presenters, and then we have today about an hour, we have an hour, we have exactly an hour, half an hour will be, about half an hour will be uh, for the presentations and the rest of the meeting will be for you to engage with us. So as you know, the IPPN is uh, a, an initiative of 10 founding UN entities uh, that aims at creating a community space where we can share lessons and experiences and together strengthen our collective capacity to apply the integrated, integrated policy um, approaches and to in concrete and practical ways to support the Agenda 2030. IPPN is a network that is open not only to UN entities, but also to government, academia, and the broader development community. And it is jointly managed by UNDP, UNFPA, UNICEF, ILO, and FAO. Uh, it hosts a series of monthly cafes that are like this one, uh, have the intent to showcase the insightful experiences of policy integration for the SDGs. And today is a, a very exciting session um, on an initiative that was launched by the Secretary General in 2021 and is gaining momentum. Uh, was also discussed at the UNGA this year with member states. It's the Global Accelerator for Jobs and Social Protection for Just Transitions. It is really a, a perfectly fitting topic for the this community space because it is a prime example of how the UN development system can come together, different UN entities bringing together their expertise and uh, um, uh, to deliver this integrated policy support, integrated policy and programming support for UN country teams. Um, and uh, the countries they serve. The, um, uh, the Global Accelerator is, uh, is an effort to, to uh, indeed accelerate the SDGs through the innovative approach of the Secretary General's Our Common Agenda. It is an effort to meet um, a very challenging moment um, for not only um, to recover from the pandemic, but also to recover, uh, to, to address the, the challenges of the multiple intersecting crises that we're facing and uh, that is and particularly to address the needs of the most vulnerable in that context. Um, and so I'm very pleased to welcome colleagues who will be able to take us through this discussion uh, with their joint presentation that again reflects how agencies are uh, coming together to integrate, to design this integrated approach to jobs, social protection, and just transitions. Um, these agencies today are ILO, UNDP, and UNICEF. And we will hear specifically uh, a joint presentation by Valérie Schmidt, who is the Deputy Director of the Social Protection Department in ILO. Jean-François Klein, who uh, is Senior Administrator uh, in the Employment Policy Department of ILO. Uh, David Stewart, who is the chief policy, um, uh, the chief of child poverty and social protection in UNICEF, and Nathalie Boucher will be starting the presentation and is the head of uh, the inclusive growth team in UNDP. Just uh, um, in in terms of how we're going to manage this, so you will be listening to the presentation. You're welcome to start posting your questions in the chat. And we will be uh, answering, uh, the, the, we will be inviting the, uh, the presenters to answer your questions that we'll be reading out of the chat. But if you do want to intervene, and um, again, this is a, a, an experience sharing session. So if you would like to share experiences of something relevant that is happening at country level, please do uh, raise your hand and we'll take the questions. Please do make sure that your microphones are muted so that we can hear the presenters. And, um, we look forward to the discussion. Over to Natalie. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Marta. So um, let's let's start. Let's start with the bad news. Can we move to the first slide, please? Uh, the bad news is that uh, clearly the world is not uh, building forward better. Um, <clears throat> is facing multiple crises, as we know, since COVID, but now compounded by uh, the war in Ukraine, not least the climate emergency. 
actually these crises are continuing to impoverish people and deepen and worsen inequalities across the globe. <clears throat> As such, the cost of living crisis that has been generated by the conflict in Ukraine has impoverished actually people at a faster pace even than COVID. As we know, markets are not, labor markets are not recovering as expected, and ILO has estimated that there is still a deficit of more than 100 million jobs. Uh, the fallout of those cascading crises is also felt um, mostly by the 4.2 billion people who are not covered by any kind of social protection. On the top of all these challenges, uh, people, uh, employment outcomes, uh, livelihoods and vulnerabilities at large are further strengthened by global pressures arising, of course, from climate and change, but also from demographic change, digital transformation and technological change at large, but also migration, urbanization. Countries are facing also, as we know, increased debt burdens, shrinking fiscal space, which means that they are confronted to tough choices and trade-offs between increasing public investment and advancing structural transformations and just transition. So they have to make very tough choices. So next slide, please. So in this context, uh, clearly, um, there is a need for more ambitious action and bold action and transformative action. And that's the reason why, and actually in the context, in the wake of COVID, the uh, global accelerator on job and social protection for just transition was launched actually in September, 2021 by the UN Secretary uh, General, General to promote a job rich recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, but now it goes much beyond that, uh, with the focus on providing adequate and comprehensive social protection for all, and to foster just ecological, technological, and social transitions. The ambition is, the pledge is huge. Uh, it's about securing 400 million decent jobs, in, especially in the green care and digital economy, also about extending protection to 4 billion people. And the global accelerator is meant to provide integrated uh, um, solutions uh, uh, and strategy to tackle challenges related to various kinds of transitions, the green transitions, of course, and we know that there might be important trade-off uh, between uh, and conflicts between uh, climate objectives and other development targets, and especially poverty, inequality, jobs, and so forth. So, so the idea is to make sure that those transitions are fair and work for um, the most vulnerable. It's also about supporting life and work transitions, and not least, uh, the, the Global Accelerator is also looking at transition out of emergencies towards long-term long recovery and uh, resilience. So next slide, please. And I'm now handing over to my colleague. Uh, over to you. Yes, thank you, Nathalie. Uh, and uh, good, af good morning uh, to all. Um, so, uh, how to meet this, uh, this ambition? Um, so, this is more the, the strategy of the Global Accelerator, which has a three multiplied by three multiplied by three approach. Uh, first, um, the three integrated policies. So, as Nathalie explained, um, to, to achieve, um, uh, and to facilitate just transitions and to uh, achieve a human-centered uh, recovery, um, countries need uh, to develop uh, integrated uh, decent uh, employment policies together with uh, universal social protection, together with specific measures uh, to facilitate the, the green, the digital transitions, also the 
uh, demographic transformations of the economy of the society. So the idea is not no longer to work in silos, but really to try to ensure that the policies uh, talk to each other and, and achieve um, uh, common objectives together. Uh, so this is the three integrated uh, policy approaches that, uh, that we have mentioned. Then the second uh, three is three pillars of action. The idea is not uh, to work only on the policy support, but also to ensure that sufficient financing is made available at country level to implement these policies. Uh, this means working uh, in close collaboration with ministries of finance, ministries of planning, ministries of economy, and also the IFI, so the IMF, the World Bank, public development banks, uh, so that uh, their, their uh, uh, programs, their projects, their loans also talk to the policy priorities that have been uh, identified. And um, the third pillar of action is coordination, of course, integrated policy and uh, aligned and adequate financing cannot happen if you don't have um, a proper coordination, collaboration at all levels, at the government level, of course, between the different ministries, um, at the UN level, uh, between the UN and the IFIs. Uh, with also all the development partners and very importantly with also the social partners which are the representatives of uh, the workers and the employers that really represent the real economy. Uh, and this comes to my third three which is Fabatism plus plus. What does it mean? It means that of course policy and financing decisions uh, cannot be made uh, behind cl closed doors that it's very important that uh, the trade unions uh, civil society employees organizations are consulted uh, because they are of course a part uh, of the solution uh, they benefit for instance from decent jobs and social protection but they also contribute to uh, to uh, through their through taxes through social security uh, contribution contributions to the development of uh, of, of social protection systems, for instance. So it's very important that uh, participation it is at the core of the accelerator. And so to achieve this three multiplied by three, multiplied by three approach, um, the UNSG uh, note, um, when he launched the accelerator is proposing a technical support facility um, that will uh, really support the implementation of the accelerator. And my colleagues will explain what it is. Next slide. <clears throat> and this is how uh, how the accelerator is going to make this uh, this catalytic change at country level. Uh, so this is a little bit what the theory of change of the accelerator that is very generic and needs to now to be translated uh, um, at, at national level to really respond uh, to the national uh, context and the national priorities. So of course it starts with a country di diagnostic that um, through stakeholder consultations, through national dialogues that really take stock of the situation, the main uh, policy uh, approaches, policy development in the country, what is maybe missing in terms of policy development, but often it's not a lack of policies, it's more the fact that they are not sufficiently implemented. Um, and also what are the key uh, drivers of change? What are the, 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 the key sectors of the economy, for instance, that, that are uh, promising, sector, promising sectors for the development of decent jobs? Uh, what are the, the key, um, uh, key ambitions of the country today? Is it formalization of the economy? Is it the extension of social protection? So identifying through this dialogue policy entry point uh, and then working on the design of uh, an accelerator for the country um, by uh, looking on uh, working on these three uh, drivers of change the combination of policies employment social protection uh, skills development tax incentives etc um, the the development of uh, um, uh, integrate the national financing framework to ensure that these policies are adequately financed and sustainably financed. 
and looking also at uh, domestic resources first and foremost, but also at additional uh, financing uh, streams uh, through ODA, uh, through uh, foreign direct investments that can also support the accelerator. And uh, to maximize the impact, the third component is, of course, political commitment, tripartite dialogue with workers, employers, a participation of civil society, and ensuring that there is a coalition of actors that, uh, that works towards the accelerator. And the idea is then, of course, not to have a tiny project uh, in, a, in a small uh, department of a small region, but really to have institutional changes at country level that are nationwide uh, and that are uh, that really contribute to change the institutions and, and with a, a, a concrete uh, implementation so that we can really, um, the accelerator can really accelerate the achievements of, of specific uh, SDGs. So next slide. Yeah. I think it's for Nathalie. And you are muted, Nathalie. Valerie, I think we are moving now to the where question, where, where, do we have the ambition to uh, roll out the accelerator? And I think that Valerie already touched upon a couple of tentative criteria. Um, of course, clearly the Global Accelerator Initiative is meant to um, respond to needs uh, of countries. And, and it's clear that um, it's about countries that are facing uh, high level of informality, high use in women and employment, low social protection coverage. But importantly, because the idea is really to be able to demonstrate and achieve uh, impact on, on the ground, uh, we expect uh, countries um, availing of the global accelerator support uh, to uh, have a strong commitment to change. Uh, uh, which can be sort of uh, captured in their uh, commitment to social protection and integrated uh, social protection employment strategies, um, commitment also to resource allocation, to make sure that countries would be in a position also to achieve demonstrable results in the, in the short, medium term, let's say, uh, four years. It's also about other enabling conditions which are more linked to our work as a UN uh, on the ground and the, the, our capacities to work together, uh, but also to engage uh, uh, with the international finance uh, institutions, um, maybe another actor, regional uh, uh, development banks uh, and so forth, uh, whether we have already joined programs and collaborative action that is working on the ground that can really be, really be an enabler for uh, uh, scaling, back, scaling up impact uh, uh, in, um, on job social protection and just transition. So uh, all this, the idea is also to make sure that initiative strikes a balance across uh, regions and country typologies and looking LDCs, but middle-income countries and seeds and fragile countries. Uh, next slide, please. So in a nutshell, uh, the ambition of the accelerator is, is to make a difference. And as we see it, first through elevating commitments uh, to ensure inclusive and green recovery and transformation through leveraging multi-sectoral UN expertise across agencies and partners, through strengthening regional and country level coordination mechanisms and leveraging also technical innovation and sustainable financing. So again, in a nutshell, the global accelerator is meant to be a game changer to ensure uh, inclusive transformation on the ground. Over to you, uh, Jean-Francois. Yes, uh, hello, IPP and colleagues. Uh, pleasure to be here today. This is Jean-Francois from the uh, ILO Employment Policy Department. Um, moving now into the, the sort of uh, implementation framework. Uh, and since you are all uh, practitioners, uh, you, uh, I'm sure you're asking some of the question, how is that, you know, how is this ambition possible? How is it going to work? 
Um, we know the challenges, you know, when it comes to addressing uh, fragmentation, addressing silos. So, you know, wh what what is there for us? You know, how how can this accelerator uh, uh, work at country level? So, we are going to zoom in on a couple of uh, uh, of our uh, implementation uh, aspects. Of course, the uh, a full fledged implementation strategy is available on the website uh, that we have in the chat. Uh, next slide, please. So just looking a little bit at the, uh, I would say, overall articulation of the governance structure. Uh, let me start with the, uh, the upper part of the, of the slide, which is basically you know, the, the, the global uh, and I would say high level political support. Just to, just to give you a sense of the political traction that this initiative uh, has right now. Uh, basically, since the Secretary General uh, launched the and, and announced the, uh, the the global accelerator uh, back in 2021 in September as part of his uh, common agenda uh, report. There's been a, a number of important milestones uh, uh, that have basically positioned also the global accelerator as part of the you know global policy discussion on on recovery. Uh, of course, the global accelerator is also seen as a uh, a vehicle that would also contribute to the. Uh, uh, World Social Summit uh, uh, plan for 2025, but there's also been a series of high-level discussions uh, in the margins of the UN General Assembly uh, uh, that have basically confirmed the interest not only from uh, potential, you know, uh, countries uh, that would benefit from the Global Accelerator, but also uh, development partners and other countries which are willing to uh, commit and support. And, and that that high-level support, which was also reflected in a statement from IFIs, uh, uh, the regional development banks and other partners really constitute uh, a, a key feature of the global accelerator. Uh, we have put that here uh, a sort of a global coalition. You may uh, you may have heard that uh, also the the ILO director general is uh, uh, is uh, thinking to establish a, a global social justice coalition which could also uh, uh, be uh, uh, or featured as part of this, uh, this uh, global coalition. This is, uh, I would say, still a work in progress. But I think what is important, uh, an important takeaway is really to understand the uh, high level support and the visibility uh, that the global accelerator will have also as part of uh, UN systems and UN, uh, UN coordination mechanisms. There's been also a very strong positioning of the Global Accelerator in G7 and G20 uh, communiques. And uh, we uh, intend, of course, to harness and leverage that support also as part of a country uh, implementation uh, rollout. So this, I would say, global coalition, which will also have an advisory group, will really you know, steer uh, the, uh, the, the overall process and make sure that uh, um, uh, progress at country level in the selected pathfinder countries will be uh, also duly uh, reported and, and highlighted also to ensure uh, cross fertilization. Um, uh, uh, David, after me, will uh, zoom in a little bit more on this technical support facility and the details around that. So I won't, uh, I won't uh, uh, talk about it here, but going looking now uh, at, at the bottom in terms of national coordination structures. What we are really not trying to do is to recreate uh, uh, or reinvent the wheel when it comes to national coordination structure. We intend, and the Global Accelerator will very much be anchored into uh, existing uh, coordination or governance system at country level. That will be, of course, identified that are very specific, uh, as you know, to each country. And starting, of course, with uh, the UN cooperation frameworks, but that can also be, of course, uh, expanded to existing uh, national uh, uh, advisory committee, national steering committees. So we will need to, of course, assess what is the best you know, anchor for the global accelerator at country level, but that's really the key message is either to strengthen existing uh, structures or uh, 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 use the one that you know, could be uh, functional and really focus on, the, uh, on making them uh, uh, work well. Uh, they are uh, on the left, on the right side, you can see uh, also um, uh, a snapshot of other initiatives that will also contribute to the Global Accelerator, like the you know, USP 2030, the Climate Action for a Job Initiative, or the uh, Global Decent Jobs for Youth Initiative, that will work also very much in uh, sync and, uh, and, and, and articulation 
uh, with the uh, with the global accelerator. Uh, next slide, please. So on the on the website, you you will also find a series of uh, thematic what we call thematic roadmap that are have been uh, aligned with the uh, priorities of the common agenda. So we have a thematic roadmap on informality. We have a thematic roadmap on on use on social protection. On, on just on transitions. Uh, um, and we also have a thematic roadmap on financing, uh, which as, as uh, Valérie has explained, is a, is a key pillar of the uh, global accelerator. So here, what we intend uh, to do is first off to try to uh, base you know, our work on the integrated national financing framework where they exist or you know, as part of ongoing process related to uh, national financing strategies. As you all know, the, uh, for countries to achieve uh, a DG and, and mobilize the financing needed for uh, 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 achieving, uh, uh, achieving outcomes at, at scale, the bulk of resources need to come either from domestic public resources. So the question is how to boost these resources, how to uh, help countries expand their fiscal space, but also uh, how to uh, uh, how to make you know and attract uh, the domestic and internal international private financing and make this private financing more effective of course between the two you have all the uh, blended finances uh, initiative uh, the work of uh, uh, public development banks also in uh, in uh, leveraging private financing so all that is of course uh, very much central to what many of the uh, of that the UN family is already doing we will also uh, base our work, of course, on, for instance, uh, initiatives that have been supported as part of the joint SDG fund window uh, on financing, for instance. So the, the idea of the technical support facility also that David will present in the next slide is that, uh, sorry, I'll just stay on this one, is that uh, the Global Accelerator also uh, uh, aims at influencing what we call the, uh, the, uh, uh, the big you know, ODA ticket items for instance, when it comes to uh, concessional financing, to uh, budget support, to, to major uh, grants or programs, so that uh, the, uh, the dialogue between uh, financing institutions, the, the government, uh, the private sector, and, and the UN uh, family can really take place as part and under this overall framework and making sure that uh, whatever uh, negotiation are taking place can really take into account the uh, objective of the global accelerator at country level this is uh, this is not a mere uh, i would say uh, um, you know wishes uh, this is really based on discussions we had with a number of uh, financing uh, partners which really see the role of the global accelerator in you know supporting uh, uh, developing a structured demand from governments in terms of integrated employment uh, promotion and social protection policy. So we, we really believe this, this can really be a game changer. And under that, uh, you have, I would say, the more traditional funding of uh, a number of uh, projects and programs that will uh, indeed uh, play as, you know, what will have this catalytic effect in uh, leveraging financing. So this can be the uh, joint UN programs under the new uh, joint SDG fund window, which will be open for, uh, which will be launched for uh, to support the global accelerator. It is called the uh, joint SDG fund window on decent jobs and universal social protection, but also can be, of course, standalone projects that would also align with the uh, global accelerator. A new feature here as well, and again based on discussions with development partners, uh, is the potential alignment of. Uh, development partner uh, bilateral programs with the uh, results framework of the accelerator at country level. But David will further uh, uh, will go into further details on that. Uh, over to you, David. And next slide, please. Thanks so much, Jean-Francois. Um, everybody, great to be with you and have this chance to just uh, discuss the accelerator. So yeah, I'm really just going to focus in on this technical support facility piece, which uh, you've heard about in in previous slides. And we really see this as a as a sort of core, um, sort of the oil, which is going to help this machine uh, run effectively. And the technical support facility really has a couple of broad overarching functions. One of them is going to be around the operation 
connections, the administration, the resource mobilization that is needed for the global accelerator to be a success. And the second is a technical support and engagement function. So it really is to create a structure and creates probably the wrong word because it's building on existing structures. I'll go into that a little bit more um, to provide the best technical capacity and resources and support that we have within the organization. And to do this in a sort of more seamless way than we've been doing it before. So we can raise expertise across the organization, even if it's not the agency that we're necessarily part of. So that's very much the ambition of the technical support facility. And you hear, you can see here a few of the structural elements of how we're thinking of, of putting this together. So there's going to be a technical support coordination, a technical function coordination team, um, which will oversee the overall management of the global accelerator, will lead on resource mobilization, will provide operational support to countries and oversee the overall results framework. So sort of a secretariat function uh, to provide this support to, to countries that are moving forward on the global accelerator. Um, and then you have a hub of the of the global accelerator, which is really to provide more in depth country support um, as countries need particular technical expertise. So to support on project formalization, implementation, results, monitoring and evaluation, good practices, capacity building. And this is the area where what we're looking to do is really seek the expertise that we have across the organization. And we know um, that different agencies have different strengths in different areas of social protection and, and, uh, uh, and, and employment. Um, so it's really to bring that existing expertise together, coordinate it and set things up so they can respond to particular technical needs that come up as we're moving forward on the accelerator itself. Um, and then at the bottom, you have the national coordination structures. Uh, and it's, I think, important to stress, it shouldn't be lost. This is the heart of the accelerator, is what's happening at national level and the national push to move forward on, on social protection and expansion of jobs. Um, so you, you see here the UN joint programs being you know, fundamental to this process. Also, there may be uh, elements of the accelerator which aren't already in a UN joint program, so they may stand outside it, um, but fully coordinated within national coordinated structures. And when we see this aligned project, this speaks to work that can be going on outside um, of, of the UN family. It could be um, a, a development partner work that's ongoing or work of uh, IFIs, which won't be fully, fully coordinated as part of a global accelerator structure, but our work is to try and bring them in the national coordination approach. So we have sort of one coordinated approach to move forward on this rapid, rapid expansion of social protection and the creation of, of high quality, of high quality jobs. Um, so this, I think, gives a gives a sense of where we're moving on on the global accelerator. And again, just to stress, we're talking about building on existing structures um, as they exist globally, regionally, uh, and in countries, of course, where the work will be taken forward. So we're we're starting a process of mapping the different uh, uh, strengths that we have across agencies, the availability to provide support for the global accelerator technical support facility. Um, and we're hopeful to create something that will be much more seamless and much more integrated as we work together, which is what we must do to achieve the really ambitious goals that we have as part of the accelerator. If we could move to the next slide. Here, we just wanted to give a sort of indicative sense of what a country consultation process might look like, where there's interest in becoming a global uh, pathfinder country of the global accelerator. What, how might that process play out? Um, and it is indicative because the paths may be different in different countries. This is really about a country driven uh, process. Um, but this is how it may look. So starting with engagement with the technical support facility, and we've had meetings where we've had the technical, the folks who are currently on the technical support facility meeting at country and regional level to really explain processes and how we can be moving. Um, a meeting with a resident coordinator in country to start building understanding and, and see the potential to move forward as a path, find a country. An initial country review, so to have a feel and a sense of where are we in terms of the policies and programs that are in place, their implementation, their coordination, where the gaps are. This really gives us the, the map collectively, to the, the, which gives us the path to how we can move forward to this rapid expansion that we're, that we're looking to undertake. And then, of course, crucially is the engagement of uh, national stakeholders led by government partners, so across ministerial and stakeholder consultations to really see how we can move forward together and build that ownership for it 
to be taken forward at the, the national level. Um, for the accelerator to work, high level political commitment we think is really crucial. And you've heard at the UN level, we really uh, have the highest level of commitment and support for the accelerator. And this really gives an, a new opening we think to this, to this, uh, to the work on social protection and and uh, the expansion and creation of of high quality jobs. So that that getting to that point of high level government commitment is really a crucial moment. In yes, we're really ready to take this on at a high level and and oversee it. Um, and from there, we move into the national consultations to develop roadmaps, implementation, the sort of monitoring that we'd we'd normally see. So this is what a, an indicative country consultation process would look like. But it is again, it is indicative. The heart of the accelerator is to build on what there is and to help accelerate and support what there is. So there may be existing functions and engagements and coordination mechanisms in countries that would rapidly become the heart of of these uh, of these conversations. So if we could move to what I think will be our last slide, just to give a few sense, a bit of a sense of the next steps. Uh, you've had a, a bit of a sense of where we are, so where do we need to, to move from here? Um, so first is the continued identification and confirmation of Pathfinder countries, including the sort of processes that we uh, outlined in the previous slide. We are rolling out the fundraising plan um, to Towards launch of a social protection fund window in April 23. This is uh, really crucial, of course, in in, in really uh, allowing us to accelerate in the way that we that we need to do. Um, and then the ongoing development of the technical support facility that I mentioned. So this mapping of technical capacities uh, and developing a structure uh, and ways of working that we can provide this support across the across the agencies, across the organisation to to move forward. Um, and then finally, just noting the global accelerator web page I think it was also uh, placed in the chat but you can find all the documents all the information uh, there as well uh, for follow-up and I know this presentation will, will also be shared um, so I think on our side uh, that's it for now um, thank you so much David and, yeah over to you yeah thank you indeed it's uh, 8 40 we start we did start a little bit later so i i really applaud our presenters for being very concise and very clear in my view it was an excellent presentation um so thank you david jean francois valerie and natalie uh they're here to answer your questions so of which i see very very few i have to say in the chat so i encourage you to post more um, but um, I will start with so Elisabeth Tosu asked in the chat, uh, to what extent this is really transformational? What do we mean about achieving a transformational impact and perhaps elaborate on that? Um, a second question is on whether there are uh, pooled funding mechanisms already at country level that could be accessed for this uh, sort of resources if you're available. For example, this was Rita Shara. Uh, from uh, you, and I tell you a, a third one from UNDP Oslo Governance Center, Julia. Um, do I understand well? Sorry, I'm just. Uh, go ahead with the with taking perhaps the first two, and then I'll read the other question. <laughs> Um, so, if any of you wants to elaborate on the transformational impact of this in, of this strategy, strategic approach, integrated approach, with respect to current Valérie, yeah. yes, thanks. Uh, I will start from uh, my perspective, which is more on social protection, and I'm sure my colleagues will will add on that. Um, I mean, when we you look at the social protection situation around the globe, you have four billion people who are not covered at all. And among those who have coverage, so the, the rest of the world's population, uh, in most cases, this, this coverage is not comprehensive, not adequate. So for instance, they only have access to child benefits or to health care, but not to the rest of social protection. Um, and if we really want to have a transformation of this situation, you need to work uh, on at least uh, two, um, two levers. One is... Uh, um, the financing. So there's not enough financing. We, we estimate that uh, countries in develop, the developing countries should invest 3.8% uh, of their GDP in addition to what they invest today in social protection. So how can you achieve that? 
financing, more financing, more investments in social protection. And the second uh, bottleneck or lever is, of course, the persistence of the informal economy. And this, this, uh, this means that people don't have access to decent jobs opportunity. They don't contribute to social security. They don't have enough income to live on. They cannot pay taxes, etc. So this means that there's also not enough financing and that they don't have, they cannot exercise their right to social security. So to work on these two levers, uh, formalization and increased financing, we need a, a new animal uh, such as this accelerator, which links actually policy development and implementation with financing and with um, and with this this platform of collaboration coordination uh, that includes, uh, um, of course, the policymakers, the finance, the, the the IFIs, uh, and all, all the different actors that can make a real difference. So it's just an example of how the accelerator for us on social protection will make this uh, this this transformation, but. I'm sure there are also other viewpoints in our group. Thank you. Thank you, Valérie. And actually, just going back to the question of our colleagues from the Oslo Center, which was very long and I couldn't read it in the chat properly, but uh, we mentioned at the beginning, you gave a little bit of the, the, the context that uh, not so Natalie was describing the context in which this uh, uh, approach was developed to respond to crisis, to respond initially to the pandemic and to crisis. And our colleague was, discuss, was, was asking on other aspects that this mechanism is trying, this, this, this approach and this strategy is trying to um, address transitions beyond, uh, again, the recovery approach, but also transitions such as um, environmental, uh, to address environmental challenges, green transitions, uh, climate change, decarbonization, and so on. So maybe if we could touch a little bit upon this aspect of uh, um, uh, the, the, the various transitions and the different uh, um, challenges that can be uh, um, tackled with this sort of integrated approach, uh, what dust transitions encompasses also from an environmental perspective. Who would like to take this? I can take this. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, hi, Julia. <laughs> it's a good question. No, I think as, as mentioned, um, <clears throat> of course, the global accelerator was a forward looking you know, response initially to COVID-19. But when we say forward looking, it's not only about COVID-19, it's also about looking at the uh, longstanding challenges and structural challenges that economies and societies are, are facing across the globe. And the intent was really to take this in port in a way to seize COVID-19 as an opportunity to spur transformation. So I hope it clarifies. And now, of course, with the war in Ukraine and all those cascading crises we are facing, the global accelerator remains still relevant because of this forward-looking approach. Because at the end of the day, the, the challenges are, are the same. How do we promote transformative change for people? You know. Uh, in the context of climate change, how do we ensure that green transitions are working for people, you know, and against, not against people and so forth. So, so I think from that perspective, I mean, clearly the global accelerator relevance goes beyond COVID-19 as such. So, so if, I hope this is clarifying. And yes, um, actually in the, in the global accelerator strategy, we are flagging uh, Oh, you have another question, Julia. Uh, Julia, on the top of that. No, I see your hand. Yeah. I can uh, add. Uh, yeah, thank you. And then we'll go back to the question on the on the funding, on the pool funds that was also pending. But uh, um, let me give. Uh, this is also. It's good that you're taking the floor, Julia. Is also to contribute to that. Are uh, it's, again, if you, if any of you, as examples, also to share of how we already some of these integrated approaches are happening at country level of uh, jobs and social protection, integrated approaches, please do share. If you wanna build or anything that the presenters have said, also please do share with us now in the next 15 minutes or so. Julia, over to you for your question. Thanks so much. And this, is, this was fascinating to hear from all three, four of you. Um, and uh, the, the reason why, I'm, uh, why I tried to clarify and why I'm um, keen to learn more is precisely because I feel that what you're doing goes much beyond um, COVID-19 
And uh, just to um, share in terms of background, at the Oslo Governance Center, we are exploring sort of emerging governance uh, issues, of course. And in some of the um, horizon scanning and um, review of reflection processes that we've done, um, the, the points that you raise uh, have really come up, like how um, can uh, integrated, more integrated policy um, development and implementation happen, considering that there are so many sort of cross-sectoral crises um, happening. And of course, from the governance side, and this is for, for later on, I can follow up uh, bilaterally, um, but from a governance perspective, we're of course most interested in um, what are governance aspects, either sectoral, national, regional, um, related to effectiveness, accountability, participation, for example, um, that can be supported. And I saw on some of your slides some of these aspects. So it's it's very exciting to see. And I just wanted to stress that we've seen that need for this kind of work um, as well. So thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. In fact, one my questions, my I also had a, a, um, wanted to to ask a question, if I may, uh, um, since uh, I, I don't see many hands up at the moment. Um, and I would like I would like to uh, you to elaborate a little bit, perhaps, on uh, some examples of entry points, particularly in uh, in different country typologies facing different level of uh, distress um, from a financial perspective, uh, from financial point of view, from a debt that distress from, for instance, point of view at this stage? And where do you see uh, potential entry points to start a discussion at country level on this integrated strategies? Perhaps uh, Valerie or Francois? <laughs> yes, um, yeah, thanks, thanks a lot for, for the interesting questions. Uh, I think, you know, very fundamentally, I think the there is this momentum where indeed the, the COVID crisis has told us, well, we still have a major issue when it comes to, to, uh, to vulnerable, vulnerable populations, the issue of, of course, informal economy and, and, and those who have been most you know, uh, hard hit by the, by the crisis. But also when you look about all the uh, financing for SDG debates, somehow, unfortunately, still the issue of, of decent jobs and social protection are not always very much on top of the agenda. Let me, let me give you a few examples. In the integrated national financing frameworks, uh, according to our initial assessment, but we will need to probe more into that, the issue of, for instance, employment policies and to some extent, uh, social protection or the extension of social protection coverage, for instance, are not very well reflected. Um, this is due for various reasons. For instance, uh, typically employment policies are not uh, uh, necessarily costed, and there is a tendency to have, you know, as part of INFF only, the policies that uh, are costed. So somehow the, the job and, you know, employment promotion uh, uh, dimension is still very much seen as a residual of growth or of investment. And I think we are still, we are still trying to push to make sure that uh, as part of you know, policy decision and investment decisions, this virtuous cycle between you know, decent job creation and productive job creation that can then you know, enhance the fiscal space for the extension of social protection you know, and enhance national revenue is very much central to uh, policy making. And, and this, is, this is in many instances not the case. So that's one, one point. The second point is really about these integrated strategies. Uh, again, we in, in the ILO, we do a lot of what we call employment impact assessment. So what is the impact of investment, let's say, in infrastructure? Um, and we are able to you know, do this modeling analysis of you know, number of jobs created, uh, you know, direct, indirect, or induced. The social dimension, whether the formalization aspect, uh, the issue, of course, around wages or even skills level, or gender aspects are, are still not, as, as we see from these assessments, still not sufficiently considered into investments. And, and this now relates to your question, uh, uh, Martha, related to you know, just transition. If you take the example of, of Vietnam, who has you know, this big plan of you know, shifting from coal to, to cleaner energy, the question is, you know, what will be the implication in terms of you know, job destruction? What are the implications for you know, new job creation? And 
what are the you know kind of social protection systems and fabric that needs to be put in place so that you know uh, people can can transit and we ensure this this just transition approach and that that can be applied to other uh, to other i would say what we call the future of work transformations and all the, the, the big drivers of, of transformation and whether we are talking about structural transformation so we are not trying to you know uh, address all the problems here i think we want to be quite you know realistic and modest especially in this first phase where we want to develop this proof of concept but there are many also low hanging fruit on which we can we can build and harness and this is what we aim to do also in, in collaboration with you know the, the un country team unrcs and other partners uh, and and many of uh, also uh, the financing partners uh, are, are quite interested to see what could come out of these you know national discussions uh, at country level uh, I think David thank wanted. you so much, Jean-François. Yeah, I'm going to give the floor to David. No, but thank you also for uh, pointing to this important aspect of convening different partners, which was going to be perhaps another point we could touch upon. That is, that also has a sees an important role of the resident coordinator to 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 convene and and bring together different partners uh, that could uh, join in this discussion to uh, at country level with uh, all the different expertise and and the perspectives that can bring. David, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Marta and 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 Julia uh, for the question, and and I agree very much with what Jean Francois was was saying. I mean, I think when we we look at social protection in particular, we've seen a real change in trajectory over the last five, seven, eight years, and I think in in some ways it, it's there were pieces of it that came from the maps missions, and and I'm assuming a bunch of people are familiar with maps missions in this network, uh, where where from those missions we tried to bring everything together, and one of the things which emerged across many of those missions was social protection, and it emerged across not only in two ways, both as an accelerator to move things forward rapidly, but also as fundamental to leaving no one behind. So these two major pushes that we had at the UN, where actually there was a piece of it that was at the center. Um, and then as we hit COVID, its importance became incredibly clear um, across, I mean, both immediately, but also how it affects across its role affecting across sectors. But then I think we're in quite an interesting moment now, because on the one hand, is there a risk that we're a bit pleased with ourselves about what happened through COVID? I saw, I mean, I hope not, but I think there's a sense like, yeah, we responded well. There was a real big increase in programming. And, you know, there's a positive feel from the social protection response from COVID. And there's a lot to be happy about about that. But nonetheless, a lot of those programs were short term. They didn't meet the scale of the problem. As Valerie mentioned, they didn't cover the full life cycle risks that we're looking at. And then, Julia, as your question points out, we're now entering something that's going to be much bigger than COVID over the course of time in terms of the climate impacts we're saying. So it's a really interesting moment of transition. And to, to, to really make this transformation, um, there's a, I see a question about the importance of political will. I sort of think that's where this sits really, really crucially, because technically we know a lot about how to move these things forward. Uh, the challenge is, can we get that level of political support and the financing that comes with it? Uh, and I think the accelerator is opening a very interesting window, given the level of support at the top of the organization, at the top of the United Nations the Secretary General support and how that can play out in terms of how we reach, reach countries. So I think the, the, the transformations are going to vary by country, but overall, I think there's clarity about where we need to move. And it's about accessing that political will and the financing that hopefully is going to be going to be coming uh, as we as we deal with this transformation um, together. Marta, you are mute. Yes, I know. I'm muting myself. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much, David, for your um, very good and comprehensive answer. Um, indeed, I mean, we, there is an interest also from this expert uh, group to hear uh, about what is happening. Um, some examples of uh, some of these uh, integrated approaches to job and social protections that may be uh, um, not related to this, not with the whole aspiration of the global accelerator, but something that is already uh, uh, happening that could offer inspiration and uh, and, uh, and on entry points in, in different country settings. And also perhaps um, examples of partnerships um, beyond the UN, that uh, within the UN system, broader system and beyond, that are uh, also relevant for this sort of uh, policy, integrated policy strategies. Uh, some of the discussions that are happening with countries, um, uh, that UN country teams are having, uh, again, in the context of facing this different crisis. 
um, that are affecting pretty much every country typology in different ways. Um, I don't see other questions. Uh, so I wonder whether there's a hand. Sorry, Marta. There's a hand from uh, Walid uh, Baharun. Okay, apologies for missing it. Please, whoever has a hand up, Walid, speak up. Thank you. You have the floor. Um. Otherwise, there is um, Christine who is saying, um, I don't see the uh, institutional affiliation. So perhaps uh, I would invite you to ask to, to ask the question that you posted in the chat, Christine, and introduce yourself. Christine Wellington Moore. Uh, yes, Christine Wellington Moore. I'm actually with you, NDP. Um, I have to go on a mobile device because I it's nighttime here, so I'm still with childcare in between this call. But nevertheless, um, no, I just wanted to comment that, um, you know, the discussion about commitments from governments for social protections and things like that. Um, in this region, we've been experimenting with doing future of work uh, systems engagement. We have a similar, um, a similar approach done by uh, ESCAP within a map mission for the Maldives, for example. But one of the things that we found was useful to, I won't say prevent, but like to get, to prevent this idea that it's a trade-off between a quick win and, and, and you know, protections comes down the list was by using systems engagements where, you know, many times we have these high level engagements or fragmented engagements at community level versus government level, et cetera, um, where you're trying to determine your problem space and, 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 and the issues. But what we found was that doing a deep um, human-centered engagements that were, you know, very wide horizontally and deep vertically. So you're going from government um, to subnational government, you're going from communities, you're going to informal sector and, and, and business, formalized business. And when you lay out that problem space, you really get to see how all, all it interlinks, whether it's, you know, issues around education and skilling, if there are cultural issues, of course, if the policy enabling environment is incorrect, access to finance and, and so forth and so forth. And the element of social protections then also comes up, um, especially when it comes to the area. So it was really very interesting is how many, uh, particularly younger, I say younger in terms of 40 and under, um, men and women were saying that, you know, because women, this is just an example, women were tied more to this unpaid care of parents and children and whatever else, uh, they could not go and work and it was actually putting strain on the men. So there were also societal disruptions. And so this, uh, this concept of social protections then becomes really important when you have, you know, when you put it like that Thanks. to the government and you see, well, if you don't have people working, you know, you're, you're losing out on tax revenue, you're losing out on things like that. So it's just to say yeah. that, that um, how you do the engagement Thanks. could could help you overcome those issues. Thanks. Bye. Thank you so much, Christine. Sorry to cut you off a little bit. We try not to give to to go over time, even though you know, I, again, I gave just uh, one more minute because we did start a little bit later. But uh, it is time now to conclude this meeting. And I once again want to really thank very warmly um, the IPPN for the all organizing team and the presenters and all and all of you who participated today and uh, who uh, engaged in this discussion so i invite you to we invite you to join the network to continue this conversation it shouldn't end here uh you will also be able to access uh, i think various things were posted in the chat the presentation there will be the recording of today's session uh, there will be there are other resources on the platform that you're encouraged also to access. And then there will be another opportunity to engage on a different topic on the 14th of December, again, on this Knowledge Cafe, that will showcase another uh, examples of SDGs acceleration strategies with the SDG push initiative by UNDP and partners. But for today on the Global Accelerator, accelerator uh, once again, uh, thank you very much. And uh, um, please do continue to exchange on the practice network because this is really about learning from each other. Thank you. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you very much. See everybody soon. Thank you. Bye bye. Have a good day.